That was disgusting. That was a disgusting speech. It was so dishonest. It was so thick with lies to talk about this country as if no, you know, as if like Rod Steiger were running police departments from in the heat of the night, you know, that that you couldn't get a, a conviction against a dishonest cop. We get them all the time. This is not the 1930s. It's not the 1940s. Police Departments have been revolutionized in the last 20, 30 years. They look like the neighborhoods they police. They are completely integrated. Every city in America has changed in the terms in terms of policing. This was not this was not a let's just say for a minute that the verdict was correct. So what? Well, it happens all the the time. We get correct verdicts all the time. Both of those speeches were about how America is racist again. Where is the racial component of the Where is, uh, that's another. Where is it? Like, did, has anyone yet provided the shred of evidence to suggest that it was a racial killing? I wasn't even. Like, you know it, why? It, none. And then not only that, you have Joe Biden out there saying that America's police, all of our systems are actually systemically racist. That if you're a black person in America, you should feel an existential risk just by living, just by living your life. You could be, you could be killed at any moment. But also, most cops are good. I don't believe you. I don't believe that that's what you think about cops. Yeah. If, you, you, if, if, well, you if what you think is that America, because these these two are in, they are mutually exclusive positions. If most cops are wonderful, good people, and only a few are bad apples, then how can you argue that the system of policing is so fundamentally broken that black people are walking around in mortal fear for their lives every single day? Look, it's not that I'm clairvoyant when I said what exactly they would say. It's that their agenda is perfectly clear. Yeah. And it's always the same, which is let us take a data point. The data point may not fit our narrative, but we'll twist it so that it does fit our narrative, right? We won't actually have to show evidence that it was a racial killing, but we'll say that it was a racial killing because then it fits our narrative. And then we take that racial narrative and then we blow it up so that it is all encompassing. It is the narrative of all of America. And then if you just give us more power, then we will fix it for you. But don't worry, because here's the thing. It will ne- we'll never reach the promised land. We will always be Moses on the mountaintop gazing over at the promised land, but we will never reach it. It's like Zeno's paradox. The closer we get to paradise, we are still not, we're never going to reach paradise, which means if you just keep incrementally giving us power, then at least we're moving in the right direction. They, 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 there's no mission accomplished here at any point. Now, listen, you, I think the life is about there never being a mission accomplished banner because there's really never a mission accomplished banner in life. Yeah. But you have to at least have some metric when you suggest that massive power is to be shifted from the individual to the federal government. You have to have some metric of success that you can demonstrate. And there is no metric of success that they can demonstrate along really, anywhere here. There has to be no room for hate in the heart of any American. Yeah. That's, 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 that's what he said. That's, right. that's what he said. And I mean, first of all, hatred is a perfectly reasonable emotion to show in some, some cases. And part of the, what defines us is what we hate. There's always going to, and there's always going to be sinful hate. There's always going to be wrongful hate in, in well, America and everywhere else. The, the, so the, you can never part and parcel of the, the redefinition of humanity. That if you, if you redefine all the systems of the, of the government, if you redefine all the systems and institutions in which we live, be. you will remake human beings yep. into to pure angels. And that, that's that's endemic to everything that they're saying. Yeah. The funny thing is pure angels have hate. Here's some member <laughs> questions. Do y'all think they're letting riots go on to create a crisis that they'll solve with nationalized police? Can this go hand in hand with defunding local police and passing gun control to finally create a totalitarian federal government? That is what I think they want, is they want federal police. They, they do not like the fact that the police are responsible to the community. They Obama was doing that town after town, was uh, forcing them into federal oversight. And every time he did it, crime went up because the rules of engagement became so absurd. Local policing is one of the great uh, things that America has. The fact that you have a, you know, if you live in Nashville, you have the Nashville police. They know the community. They're responsible for the community. The federal government hates that. They hate people. They hate the people. They hate the people. They do not trust the people. They don't respect the people. They think the people should not be making their own decisions. They think the problem, the endemic racism is not in the government. It's not in the system of government. It is in the people. They do not like the very idea. When you talk about individuals, they hate that. They hate the idea that we are a mass of individuals, each with his own desire to make our lives better, which is what powers America, what's made America great. By the way, is the next great conflict. And they just despise it. The next great conflict is going to be federal state. Right, because yeah. it, because yeah. the, the goal of the Democrats yes. right now is to yes. federalize all the things. Yeah. Right? It's not just about federalizing police forces, which is barred by the Posse Comitatus Act, and you can't do it legally. But what, what it really more than that is about, it, they're trying to federalize all voting procedure. Yeah. Right? Right. They, they, want, they want literally everything run at the top level so they can remove all power from the states to provide any sort of barrier to what it is that they would like to do in reshaping all of America, which is why you're seeing governors increasingly in red states say, Listen, you can pass whatever laws you want. We're not helping you enforce them. Yep. And the, the last bailout bill ref, uh, forbids states to raise taxes, basically. Which... Cutting taxes, yeah, cut taxes. <laughs> cut, yeah. Cut, cut taxes. You talk about uh, they hate the people yeah. that they're leading, and that's you find this in the cities, too. The, 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 the people running the cities 
despise those cities and despise the people in it, which is you can't lead something that you hate. And I mean, a really absurd example that everyone laughed about because it was hilarious, but also really disturbing is, I forget which city it was, but there was some mayor of a city, maybe it was in South Carolina, where she wrote this weird poem yeah. um, <laughs> comparing her city to a rapist. <laughs> Charlottesville. And it, 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 it's, Char- yeah, right. Charlottesville. Right, Charlottesville. And, it's, and yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because it's so absurd, but also you're the mayor of the city and this is what you think <laughs> of your, your city that you lead. It's just... There's no way to hate to, to lead something but th- that you hate. This is also what I was saying about the revolution from inside the institutions, right? This is what they've actually realized now, is yeah. that it used to be the revolutionaries were against the people who wanted to use the institutions for change. Right. right? This is the conflict between the radicals and, like, the LBG <coughs> administration, for example. And now they've realized, what if it's just perpetual revolution from the inside? What if we just take over the institutions from the inside and we use those for the perpetual revolution? Because there is something odd about watching Joe Biden, a creature of government for his entire adult life. Yeah. A person who's been in Washington, D.C., on the tax paradigm for his entire adult life. Since before he was constitutionally old enough to serve. Correct. That's right. And That's it, right. there's something weird about that guy talking about the systems of American racism and how they're deeply embedded. And that guy's been in Congress since 15 years before I was born. Yeah. I mean, he's been there forever. And, and yet he's capable of doing this work because he's going to shift the institutions into instruments of the revolution. So another member question. Do you think that Biden and Kamala actually believe their lies or are they so engrossed in pushing their narrative that they're just fine with completely lying to the American people? Well, Matt? I don't think Biden believes anything, really. I think I think part of that is a function of the fact that he's been in government forever. So he's just been I, I don't, you can't survive in government for that long um, and have any real conviction. You have to be totally emptied of any personal convictions at all. And also he's he's half senile, which is which he is clearly. Um, as far as Kamala, I think it's I think it's the same thing. But they, they don't we, we, we were talking about this off there. Do they when they talk about George Floyd and, and how they're still mourning him after all this time? Do the people saying that uh, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Kamala Harris, do they really feel that inside their hearts? So that are, are they personally a year later still in mourning over this guy? They didn't even know. Um, it's it's hard to believe. I don't think they do, but a lot of the people in the streets are indoctrinated, so for, so for them it's real. To quote a very famous politician, what is truth? Uh, <laughs> Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate is a cynic, so he says, what is truth? It's, it's not that he's pushing lies. It's not. It, he just doesn't care about the truth. And he is, in some ways, the archetypal politician because politicians generally are focused on their interests and are not so concerned with eternal truths. And this is especially true of the left, which even at the intellectual level, very often denies objective truth. This is so much what the upheavals of the, especially the 1960s and 70s were about, is denying that there's, there's anything permanently true, that it's all, it's all just social constructs. This is a sort of cosmic accident. And so ultimately, what does politics come down to? It comes down to constructing a narrative that may or may not have any relationship to reality, in so doing, through this act of redefinition and narrative, changing the reality and therefore forcing our will on people as a brute interest group. I think I think Kamala and Joe absolutely believe that, and I think they're doing a very good job at it. Next question. Why is the president of the United States and the vice president of the United States, why are they giving a statement at the end of a trial as if it affects the nation in any way? <laughs> that's a, well, that's Ben's point of it, really. This it's an is individual not individual criminal trial. We have thousands of them. <laughs> yeah. Every single every, every single day. Every and, single day. And it's not representative. This is the thing, you know, when when they were making movies against the war on terror, they would make movies in which American soldiers would rape like Iraqi women and things like that. And their argument would always be, Well, this really happened. And you'd think, okay, it really happened, but was it representative? There were 200,000 troops over there. Right. One guy does a bad thing. Is that representative of what the military is actually doing? Is that the war story, the only war story you're going to tell? This is the game the left is constantly playing now, right? Which is they take a, a piece of anecdotal data. It doesn't even have to back, really, what they're saying. And then they just spin it into whatever they want it to be. Right. And then they say, this piece of anecdotal data is evidence of the entire system. Right? This is, by the way, is every ta codes column for the last 10 years. Right? Here's something bad that happened in 1890 in Tuscaloosa. And it was really, really bad. Yeah. And now if you fast forward 130 years, nothing has changed. Yeah. And, and, and you're like, well, some things happened between 1890 <laughs> and now. Like, a few things happened, it seems like. And, and there, I, I even love this on the alt-right when they're like, what about the USS Liberty uh, yeah. being bombed by the Israelis in the 1960s? <laughs> And yeah, what about the British burning down the White House? <laughs> what are we talking about? When, when, you, when you don't provide any data, there, there was, a, there was a, a wonderful piece. And when I say wonderful, I mean horrific piece in the Washington Post um, by a, a columnist. And there was one line in it that just struck me forcibly. She was talking about how she feels as a black woman in America dealing with the police and looking at all these tapes. And she was talking about how, how terrifying it is to deal with the police and the threat of the police. 
She didn't have any actual anecdotal even experiences personally with her bad experiences with the police. But at one point, she says, she says, statistically, it would seem statistically that you're more that I'm more likely to be shot by a police officer than a crackhead. Now, normally a sentence like that is followed by, you know, a statistic. It would seem statistically. I mean, the word statistically usually conveys some sort of statistical information. No, it was just the end of a parenthesis. Move on with the story. Because there is no statistic by which you are more likely to be shot by a cop right. than a crackhead. Who right. said on Twitter this week uh, a black person has a 50-50 Chelsea, shot? Chelsea Handler. Chelsea Handler said 50-50 shot of being shot by the cops. Of course, there's no statistical reality there. Some of this goes back to a book that's come up. <laughs> we've talked about it before on Backstage, Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Um, and he talks about the, you know, the the birth of psychological man, and that's that's what we are. We're, if something is seems psychologically to be true, if it seems true to you, then that's all that matters. The statistics don't don't play into it. So the, this the, is the terrible thing about that is that's what racists tell me too. When when yeah, racists, right. when, when race, people who don't like black people will say to me, "Well, in my experience, this has happened and that's happened." You go like, "Well, maybe that's not the whole world," but they say the same thing. It's my lived experience. How can you argue? You with know, it? getting back though to the questioner, I do think we have to correct the questioner because they said, well, "Why?" are the president and vice president making a statement now after the trial's over, after it doesn't matter? The president and vice president made statements before the trial was <laughs> yeah, over, yeah, too. Right. Joe yeah. Biden made one this week and obviously pressured the jury. Joe Biden made a statement making it clear that he wanted a guilty verdict. And a few hours later, the yeah. verdict came. I'm not saying that those two things are necessarily connected, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm also not convinced not. that they're coincidence. You know? <laughs> right.